is Butch Swain, a farmer from southeast Iowa, also national promotional director for the National Farmers Organization, NFO, at Corning, Iowa. Today on our Midwest Farm Report, we have a number of guests that are interested in the farming picture as a whole, quite interested in business and various other interests from around the country. And I'd like to start out by introducing to my extreme right over here, Coleman Scott, a businessman from the Midwest and other places throughout the country. And then to my immediate right, Jim Parker, the Parker Vacuum Cleaner Supply Company of Des Moines, Iowa. And then on my left, I have Ed Shima, a large farmer from over in Iowa County, Iowa, that helps in his spare time to get people to understand the farm problem, to get others to see that we farmers should work together to solve this problem. And to start off with today, we would like to bring a few figures here. In a recent survey that was made of the Sioux City, Iowa livestock market. Now on one given day, there was enough hogs and enough cattle on this particular market that we want to show you the loss of income that is taking place in rural America. There was receipts this particular day, and these are actual receipts and actual prices that the farmers received. There was receipts this particular day of 12,099 head of cattle, and the top price was $21. Now supposing that everyone received the top price, which everyone knows they don't, but nevertheless, they were still being shortchanged at least $11.50 a hundred from the prices they should be to get the farm prices in balance with the rest of it. And the same has been figured out on hogs. And it was found that in this one day's marketing, the farmers in the area around Sioux City, Iowa marketing area alone was shortchanged $1,604,193 dollars just on one day's marketing. This is the astounding figure that has caused the businessmen of rural America, is causing them, I should say, to wake up and find out that the farm problem is not just a problem of the farmers, but a problem of everyone in the United States. And first, I would like to call on uh, Mr. Uh, Jim, or Mr. Coleman Scott, who is a businessman, advertising business, various other things. Why don't you tell us, Coleman, how your business is and how it affects you as you see it? Well, Butch, I think probably the most important part of it, as it immediately appeared to me, a few days ago I was in one of the areas not too very far from Des Moines, talking with a man in the automobile business. Now, this man does all of his business with what we call rural America. About 95% of all of his business is done directly with the farmer. I was talking with him about a problem which was quite important to him, and it was important to me because he was a part of an advertising campaign which my firm was about to handle. And he said, truthfully, Coleman, I don't want to do any more business. Well, this is a, obviously something that is very strange because here's a man that is not only a good merchant, but he has a record of being a good businessman. And I said, what causes you to make a statement like that? And he reached in his desk for a stack just about this side. And he said, all of these represent a series of people with whom I've done business with for years who have had excellent records of pay. These people are now all delinquent. This has now forced me to become delinquent at the bank. This has never happened since I've been in business. In my conversation, he went on to say, it's very tough for me to sell something to a grocer, for instance, who does business with a farmer when the farmer doesn't have any money. Now, over and over, I guess, all of us have heard the story of the farmer who benefits to the extent of having two Cadillacs, one for town and one to drive down in the South 40. This automatically caused me to ask questions from him. It was this that caused me to first make my visit to you to ask for additional information. NFO was comparatively new to me. I of course, seen it, read it. As a, as a newsman, I've been in, cut, in touch with it to a large degree because I've come in contact with certain activities, certain things that have been said, certain of their national meetings. 
And frankly, Butch, I wondered who it was that was opposing the farmer from getting his legitimate share of the national part of the gross national product. This was what first caused me to ask these questions of you. Now, at your office, I picked up a sheet of paper. It's a pink one here. This is obviously something people may see. I guess the camera's not turned on it. But it impressed me because I had recently driven through the area, <coughs> pardon me, which was in mention in this particular article. It was referring to a particular part of one county of the state of uh, California, which to a large degree is owned by a major land corporation. Now, this company has a holding of 2,412,112 acres. Now, this is one company. Now, if somebody were to call this corporate farming, this would obviously make a lot of sense, but that isn't the truth. Because in addition to owning this 2,400,000 acres, they're also the largest producer of livestock in one of the foreign countries. They own 51% of the stock in a major implement corporation, but their big cash return comes from the 27% oil depletion benefits which they enjoy through the series of uh, 1,550 producing oil wells, which are on their 2,414,000 acres. So they produce cattle, enjoying a tax benefit from the oil depletion of the 27.5% allowance. And suddenly, you're not talking about farming anymore. You're talking about people in a variety of businesses. The strangest part was not their holding of this, but the fact that their board of directors also had members of the board of directors of one of the largest food chains in the United States. Now, in reading some of your material, which was placed at my disposal, I noticed that many times many of those people had been uh, most belligerent in opposing the farmer's position for collective bargaining. What is this story, Butch? Well, this story is, to make a long story short, to come right to the point here, I don't know if the camera can see this or not, but in the October convention of the chain stores, why, the vice president of the chain stores called for an out-and-out -out abolishment of the family farm system of agriculture in America. But I, why? Why, but what why? was his problem? I don't know, really, unless it's because of the fact that in the next 35 years, the amount of food produced in the United States is going to have to weigh more than double. We're going to have, have to double everything virtually in America, with the exception of the tombstones out here in the graveyard, Coleman. And <laughs> agriculture has produced 70% of the new wealth that goes into the money streams of America to keep our industry running. And it's very obvious that some of the large interests would like to own and control agriculture. This is the only reason that I can see. They didn't say why they attacked the family farm system of agriculture, but nevertheless, they called for the abolishment of the family farm system of agriculture. Well, now, one of the things that I've noticed, the national farm uh, breeders, the breeders of cattle, those who are feeders of cattle, consistently point to the amount of money that has been lost by the cattle raisers. Yet one of the largest rubber companies in the United States maintains 10,000 head of cattle on one of its ranches, again enjoying a series of the 27% oil depletion. It's pretty tough, it would seem to me, for a man who raises a hundred head to be able to uh, compete with this kind of an operation. Well, NFO would correct this situation because the people that, all the people that grow a hundred head would band together. It would equal 10,000 head in a, in a lot. In other words, it would equal anything far greater than all the rest of them own put together. This is what the family farm must do. They must band together through the NFO collective bargaining plan so that their bargaining strength is not only just as great as any other food producers in the United States, but is greater than the bargaining power of those that are buying the farm commodities. Well, I had a man, pardon me, Butch, I had a man explain something to me. Mm -hmm. I asked some questions of people in the processing business today, knowing that I was going to appear with you. And he said, Coleman, it's probably the strangest situation that exists. He said, we in turn create a processed meat product. We know what we have to sell it for because the people we're going to sell it to tell us what they want to sell it for. Now, they're going to add their profit, and we work backwards. They're going to sell it for 69 cents. We know what their markup is, so we know what we're going to sell it to them for. And by the time we finally reach the point where we buy the product that's going to go into it, 
we have to say to the farmer, this is all we can pay you because that's all there is. Now, everybody else's profit had been added to it. Now they were at the point of origin. This is exactly opposite of any other manufactured product in America. This is exactly right, and this is why the farmers must act and act now, because their whole industry is in jeopardy. And everyone else in America sets their price based on a cost of production and then a reasonable profit. Why shouldn't the American farmer be entitled to do the same thing, to start at the origin of the product? In other words, maybe to set a price on it based on what they know it's going to cost to produce it before it, the crop is ever planted, before this operation starts, and then ask and receive that price. Well, Butch, of course, the biggest, the biggest argument against, well, let's take one particular item, the biggest argument, of course, against the business of the farmers' collective bargaining has been the fact that you'd price yourself out of the European markets and the foreign markets. Now, I found that interesting reading. Well, of course, this, this isn't to me, isn't a problem, because why should we depend on the European market for a living? When we have plenty here in America, why should we depend on the European market? Last year, Coleman, we did sell one acre and four out of each four in foreign, foreign trade. But you know why we sold one acre and four in foreign trade? For the simple reason that we couldn't make a living on the three acres that we sold at home. So we built a surplus product. So we built a surplus, and we operate wholly in surplus. So there's only one difference, and no doubt you realize this much better than I would or much better than the average farmer out here, but did you ever stop to think that the only difference between a surplus, or a so-called surplus, and an inventory is to set the price on it? <laughs> so we in NFO believe that we should get together and set the price on our commodity, change our so-called surplus into an inventory, just like any other good business in America does. Well, Butch, I was in your office, as you will recall, when Jim Parker, another businessman, walked in and asked almost identically the same type of questions I asked. So I was real pleased when you said Jim and I would be together in the same show. This is ironical, folks. This, these are two business people that walked in the office the very same day, within a matter of a few minutes apart, concerned about the same things, concerned that their business was going down with the farmer, so that farming the farm problem is no longer just the problem of the farmers of America, but it's a problem of all America. And at this time, I would like to, to ask Jim Parker to express his business views and why he walked into the office and why that his, he told it, as he put it, and I want him to explain it in his own words a little later, as, as he, the more and more that he looked at this farm situation, the more that he felt the noose tightening around his neck that he would no longer be in business if the NFO should fail. And this was just two days ago. I never saw the man before, but he's a real shrewd businessman, folks. And I would like to express, get him to express his opinion, why it is that he thinks, as he put it to me, that every businessman in America should be concerned and every businessman could, should be willing and ready to help solve this farm problem. Well, Butch, uh this is an unpaid testimonial, I'll agree. Unpaid for sure. But uh, whether or not it'll be a testimonial will depend, of course, on uh, whether or not I can learn a little about the NFO. And that's my reason for being here. That's my reason for having come into the office. Uh, my business consists of contacting dealers in small communities through Iowa, northern Missouri, a little of Kansas, a little of eastern Nebraska, and uh, about two years ago, I began to feel this pinch. I put a dealer in a little town of Pattonsburg, Missouri, and I come back six weeks later to call on him, and he was gone. Now, this has happened a number of times. I'm becoming aware, and I had become aware at that time, that this little businessman in this town, when he tells me he, he doesn't have the money to buy, today I contacted approximately six dealers that told me this. And these dealers were... Uh, well-established, had been in business for a number of years, and they feel it. If these dealers are affected, then they're going to be other businessmen, surely like me. Uh, I would presume several businessmen who have already been put out of business. I'm on the verge, at least in this phase of it. Um, I came into your office in the hope that I could find out something from NFO. I've 
I've been concerned about this holding action. Um, some people agree with it, some people disagree, but uh, one thing about it, I was favorable to the NFO because they, they're doing something. I, I saw these um, television programs that you have had on Sunday afternoon, and they, um, they were good. They had, uh, they had good effect. I like, the, I like the, the, the way they go about this thing. They're going to make an effort to do this. Uh, if they can find a way to uh, bring to the attention of the businessman, to uh, uh, the Iowa citizen, to the citizens of this country, the fact that uh, we've surely got to take care of our farm program. We've surely got to get the economy of the farmer right. Every time, uh, isn't it true that every time a farm uh, closes, goes out of business, that we die a little more? Yes, this is true, and we lose more business people all the time. And I'm real glad, Jim, that you brought up this fact of the NFO holding action because this is probably the most misunderstood thing there is about our whole program. But I'd like to call your attention to the fact that everybody in America that's in business, every working man that works for a wage, all of them have a holding action all the time. Did you ever stop to think that you have a holding action on your, on your business all the time, that you set a price on your commodity? and you hold for that price, but simply this has been established before you entered business to the point that everybody walks in and, or that buys from you, pays this price without ever thinking that you have a holding action. And the fellow that you sell it to from the wholesale level, he has a holding action too. He holds it until he gets this price. He puts the legitimate markup based on a cost of production plus a profit, the same way you operate your business, and he has a holding action. Now, is it so wrong for the American farmer to do exactly the same thing? We hope to educate the people and the public that we're entitled to a cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And then, as soon as they become aware of this situation and acknowledge this fact, then we will no longer have to have a holding action such as we had before uh, that you're referring to. This holding action that we've had in the past have been to call people's attention to the situation and to test our bargaining strength with the processor, the very much the same way that a labor union, for instance, has a test of strength when they have a walkout, or at least to gain the same respect that everyone else has the right to set down and bargain in America for a fair price, Jim. That this basically is NFO. Are we moving, is, is it moving forward now? Moving forward real well. We've been expanding into many more states recently. We're, uh, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of two or 300 people that are working whatever time they can out in the area. We're gaining very rapidly at this time. I made this statement many times, and it's true, it's been proven true all the time, that everyone in America will support the NFO plan of action, will support the NFO efforts as soon as they understand it, Jim. The fact is, I will make this statement to anyone, anywhere in America that's against the principles of the National Farmers Organization are against the American farmer government. And I say this for two reasons. That, number one, it's been the law of our land for some 23 years now. It's been legal for the farmers to band together and organize and do exactly what the NFO is doing. And number two, it's the same business principle that everyone else in America uses all the time, every day, that they're open for business. Right. Now, can I make another point, Bush, okay. just before you leave me here? Um, every community in Iowa, at least every little town that I go to, when I drive down the main street, I see empty buildings. Um, businesses used to be in these buildings, but now they're not there anymore. Uh, we can't pin this all down to one little community or one group of uh, communities. Uh, just recently, I drove down the main street of Cedar Rapids from Marion, driving west, down First Avenue. And right down in the heart of uh, the, the middle of Cedar Rapids, in, a, in an area of a block or a block and a half, I counted four or five empty buildings. Now, here's one of our leading cities in the state of Iowa. Coleman, you, you saw this. Yeah, I saw that. The thing that, uh, the thing that impresses me when I see such a thing is I wonder what it was that caused a businessman who had an investment in a community to say, it's got me, I can't take it. I wonder what it was that caused this man to say there is no future in business and get out of it. Now, this is what scares me when I see that. 
Do you think it's all to the farm? Do you tr attribute it to the, to the farm economy? No, I don't attribute it to the farm economy. If I did, I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep asking questions. I don't know who's to blame. I keep wondering these points. If a man who works in a factory does not make enough money to pay the milk bill, I know he can't buy milk. So the government says to him, look, we're going to give you free milk. Right. Now, this doesn't make sense to me. Somebody should pay him enough money so that he can go buy the milk. Right. But if they do this, why did the, why did the milk cost 30 cents a quart when it was given away free to him because he didn't have enough money to get it? And the farmer got six and a half cents a quart for the milk anyway. Now, he can't buy it either. If the farmer didn't have the milk on the farm, he didn't make enough money to have bought it either. Now, if the, if the farmer does not produce a milk product, he can't buy milk for his kids today in many cases. No. Now, this is the thing that causes me to ask why. If work is work and labor is honest, uh, I started to ask a question a moment ago here. Butch says this has been going on for 20-some years. Uh, actually, Arthur Capper, who was the great friend of the uh, farmer, originated the act in 1922. The Capra Volstead Act. 43 years. I 43 years. That's what I was going to correct years. you on. But thank you for letting me interrupt. I didn't mean to. <laughs> and now we're going to turn to a farmer. A fellow that farms for a living, raising his family, doing a real good job farming on a more or less a big scale. Not real big scale, but far as a family farm, it's considered a real good operation. A good, thrifty operation. An operation where... Efficiency is practiced. We're diversified. He raises a number of things. And Ed, would you care to fill in, as you see it, what is the solution to this farm problem, so-called farm problem? Well, Butch, we have uh, in my community uh, over the years a number of our really what you'd call good farmers have been leaving. And uh, this trend is uh, continuing as I see it uh, looking at my community where uh, uh, by and large we are, all of us are pretty uh, efficient uh, farmers. We have rather large operations. Uh, we aren't what you'd call marginal farmers at all, but still when I look at the, uh, my neighbors, uh, practically all of them, uh, almost without exception, are working in the town to supplement their farm income, or if they aren't, their wives probably are, no, almost without exception. Now this is uh, a, a great concern, actually, when you look at the uh, community I live in, fairly good land and uh, fairly uh, good-sized farm operations, but still they aren't making a go of it. Now, over the years, uh, we've seen these uh, farms be, uh, become larger, uh, being uh, consolidated, and uh, going into the future, I think this is going to continue. Uh, then, as you look at these uh, farms now, they're large investments. Uh, it's hard to finance this type of operation. As they continue to get better, bigger, I, can, I wonder who's, uh, who's going to finance these. Uh, certainly, the family-type farmer can't continue to finance a larger and larger, larger operation under the... Uh, present uh, income structure that we have. So then the question is, what should we do about this? And uh, as a farmer in Iowa County, Iowa, it seems to me that we uh, need to uh, look at this in a more business-like way, do like businessmen do, put ourselves in a business position of pricing our products. And uh, in doing this, uh, this requires some responsibilities. You have to accept some responsibility to price your product. You have to accept the responsibility for the surpluses. The market might not absorb at this price. You have to accept the responsibility for an even flow into the market. You have to be in a position to convince the consumer that uh, this product is worth this, uh, this increased price to her. And uh, without elaborating on these points, I think that uh, there's no question what there's only one solution to this problem today, as I see it, and that's the National Farmers Organization. I think that until farmers are willing to uh, put their uh, heads together in terms of marketing, I don't believe that there's too much hope in improving the farm situation today. Thank you, Ed, and I think you did a real good job summing it up. Uh, I'd like to touch on what it really cost not to have the farmer in balance with the rest of them. Now, it not only costs the farmer, it costs all of our total economy. Fact is, a survey made by the independent bankers organization, this is the, the small banks or rural banks of America, where the new wealth originates, they made a survey, and they proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, had the farmers been paid in balance with the working man and with interest, that our total national economy would have been 303 billion, I said billion dollars more than it would have been in 1963. In other words, it would have been 50% higher. Everyone in America 
would have profited by increased farm prices because this price wouldn't necessarily have to raise at all to the consumer. Fact is, consumers were paying far more for a pound of beefsteak when we were getting $32 and a half or 32 and a half cents a pound for our cattle on the hooves. And we were getting 24 to $25 for hogs. Then they were paying far less for food than they are now. The Department of Agriculture shows that while food prices have gone up 29% to the consumer, the prices that the farmer received for the same amount went down some 12 to 15%. So I don't know, Coleman, who's getting this, but I'm beginning to wonder like you, who is it when it will help everybody, help the total economy, and help everybody in America? Who is it that would hold down the farmer? What is the ulterior motive behind it to starve out the family farm in America? There's no question about it. Now, the independent bankers made a little bit farther study. They showed that if the farmer had been in balance with the rest of the economy, that he would have had 21 and 8 tenths billion dollars more than he did receive in 1963. Or in other words, folks, for every dollar that the farmer got to keep or was able to keep in his business as income, he was cheated out of approximately $2 by somebody. Somebody got about $2 that should have belonged to the farmer. Now, had this happened, rural uh, or uh, business and professional income would have been $11 billion more. Rental income would have been four and five tenths billion dollars more. Corporate profits of America would have been 10 and four tenths billions more. In other words, to get the farm income up where it belongs would cost nobody anything. It wouldn't cost anything at all because the total economy would far more than make it back. The working man would get much more income or an opportunity to work more hours. For instance, in a loaf of bread, the farmer only receives about two and a half cents of it anyway. So if bread went up one cent a loaf, the farmer would get two or three hundred percent more profit than he gets off of the wheat that's in the loaf of bread. So as you see, it costs nobody anything to get the farm price up, and it's costing everybody. It's costing them billions of dollars, $303 billion gross national product because they wouldn't let it come up where it belongs. Now, I wonder why. And I would like to say this to you. With all sincerity, if you're not opposed to all this new wealth coming into rural America at decent farm prices, it's time that you begin to look around, as these businessmen have done, begin to look around and see and wonder who is causing the farm prices to be low, who is getting this extra money that all should be available to the farmers and to all of our economy on an equal basis. I think it's time that we look around. Now, in closing, I would like to call on the rest of the farmers in America to become good businessmen and women and set our pattern up in a business-like structure and operate our business by all accepted good business principles. This program today has been brought to you by the farmers in this listening area and others interested in seeing the farmer get a fair price. Tune in again next week for more information and join the farmers of America to solve the problem. Thank you.